Well, hello, that's me again. Today is April 19th. It is Friday. Thank God it's Friday. And let's get to our business, so to speak, immediately about what uh, happened allegedly with the uh, issue of Israel attacking Iran. Here is the missile threat official uh, declaration, so to speak, or rather uh, description of the uh, Israel's missile capabilities. They are not great, to put it mildly. They have, uh, in terms of standoff weapons, they have primarily what they've been using in Syria is the uh, some Popeye uh, missile with a range of about two to between two and two hundred uh, fifty kilometers. You have anti-shipping Gabriel. Allegedly, the uh, Israel uh, has some sort of uh, standoff weaponry on its submarines, but primarily, as you can see yourself, it is all uh, local, so to speak, and it uh, doesn't exceed any kind of the arm talking about cruise missiles, any range beyond the, uh, uh, well, 300 kilometers. In terms of the, obviously, ballistic missiles, yes, we have um, strategic missiles such as Jericho 3 and Jericho 2 with the range of 1,500 kilometers. As you can see yourself, for Israeli Air Force to deliver any kind of the so-called standoff strike on uh, Iran, th th it's not enough to have the 250 kilometers range cruise missile. They have to fly through a number of very unfriendly, to put it mildly, um, airspaces. So it's, um, well, well, as correctly Iranian stated, most likely it was some psyops, some local uh, sabotage people, and there are plenty of those, including those who work for Mossad, just launched things and, you know, like quadrocopters, they have been shot down. You could see yesterday on the video from the Isfahan that uh, there was some uh, air defense working, but there was nothing really serious there. So they intercepted all of them, but as Mr. Lavrov also stated, and it is uh, circulating now in Russian media, a Russian foreign ministry actually was a mediator between Iran and Israel and they told that you know what guys calm down and they said they told Israel that Iran also doesn't want uh, escalation which is absolutely natural nobody wants to go to war and so this is it that that's pretty much it Israel had this a uh, little bit of the uh, how to put it politely fa uh, face saving uh, psyops because obviously nothing serious except couple of missiles whatever the missiles there were probably cruise probably launched from somewhere who knows where and that's it that's pretty much it nothing was damaged nothing was uh, you know really seriously affecting anything except for a couple of hours of diverting flights from tehran so that's it and uh, hopefully this thing will now go down, you know, so to speak, in terms of the tensions and, uh, uh, well, we know everything now we need to know about Israel and its military capabilities. They are not great. Without the United States, Israel really militarily doesn't mean that much. So let's go to the thing which I uh, actually uh, wanted to also stress in terms of the, uh, what many people criticize me. Oh, why do you do this? You know, you go over and over about this thing about competencies and you show those curriculum vitae of people and, well, because this is the critical issue of our existence today, of the millennium. And when people think that, oh, I do this for some reason to exercise, I don't know, whatever people read in what I do, but I do it simply to keep people informed because this matters a great deal. And just to demonstrate to you, well, here we have two very famous, actually, uh, evolutionary biologists, uh, Mr. Brett Weinstein and Heather Hein. And what you see here, and this is stopped at 11, approximately 11.30 seconds, 11.43 seconds in this particular case. This is the moment when about a month ago, these two thinkers, and especially people who went through all this, you know, DEI and, you know, in whatever garbage or all garbage in Evergreen College, for example. And here is Heather Hying saying that in this particular moment, 
we used to thought that actually the uh, competence was very important and those credentials from Harvard, Stanford and other uh, Ivy League schools was uh, important. She says, and here's her quote, it's all trash. There you go. If you uh, do not believe me, just go and listen to this guy that saves America. He interviews these people and uh, you will hear yourself. Uh, it's uh, a little bit on the verbose side, but uh, again, they are biologists. They are not geopolitics uh, specialists. They are definitely not military specialists or STEM specialists, but they are scientists and just listen to what they say. So, and this is very important. That it's about credentials. And so let me start today after we discuss all this uh, situation with uh, uh, how to say it, uh, 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 Israel and Iranian relations, quote unquote, uh, let me demonstrate to you, because I will have to uh, be demonstrating this for a while now, and uh, it's important, just to give you an example. So we have the so-called responsible statecraft, statecraft or research, which is called Quincy Institute. Well, as I already stated, it's a Soros financed. It's Mr. Andrew Basevich, Colonel Andrew Basevich, so to speak, the uh, brainchild of this whole thing. And look at this. We have the guy. Alex Little, I mean, yesterday, he writes the article about in this responsible statecraft, what will NATO do with its giant Arctic footprint? The accession of Sweden and Finland means the alliance truly dominates the region, agitating already frail relations with Russia. Uh, Evidently, Mr. Uh, Alex Little has very little understanding of the geography and how the geopolitics of Arctic is formed. And so he starts right, but this is guys, this is responsible statecraft institute. But here are the people of what I presented to you with this uh, evolutionary biologist and scientist speaking about. Uh, that credentials are just garbage. It's all trash, basically, including from obviously beloved and self-promoting Ivy League. And here we have, he says that the recent accession of Sweden means that seven of eight of the world's Arctic nations fall under NATO security umbrella, with Russia being the outlier. While some analysis see the addition of Sweden and Finland as an opportunity for NATO to increase its footprint and deter Russia, the last thing the alliance needs is to scour for another avenue for confrontation with Russia. So, and again, he uh, talks about the Sweden and Finland, because they are part of NATO, are somehow um, uh, play some role in Arctic. I, I mean, the guy really needs to take a look at the map. He obviously have issues with geography. And while definitely a part of the Finland or Sweden lie in Arctic, this is not how you increase your footprint. And he continues. And... Uh, and here comes this wonderful things he talks about regarding force projection capabilities. The American dominated NATO nuclear submarine fleet outmatches the opposing northern fleet of Russian Navy, he talks about. Rather than seeing the addition of Finland, however, he continues, and Sweden as an opportunity to increase the militarization of the Arctic, NATO should work towards utilizing working groups like Arctic Council to forge multilateral uh, arrangements to reduce tensions. Well, yeah, it's all fine. Uh, hey, sure, why not? Nobody argues with that. But let's take a look at what the guy talks about, about, uh, and you know what, he's a, a kid from, as you can see yourself, that's him, uh, he's Alex Little, and uh, the question is, Alex Little is the Quincy Institute grand <laughs> strategy intern. Before joining Quincy Institute, Alex worked as the development assistant at the Cato Institute, and is also a former Marcellus Policy Fellow with the John Quincy Adams Society. So, I mean, uh, you know what? Uh, the guy obviously have uh, issues understanding of whatever his background. They say he graduated, uh, whatever, Georgia Institute of Technology or something like that. And it doesn't mean that he's an engineer. Most likely he has some kind of a political degree. I couldn't find anything on this guy. But even if he has some kind of STEM degree, it doesn't uh, uh, guarantee uh, of people being stupid and not, not only not knowing geography, but also not understanding what is this projection of force uh, really is. Well, here is the issue. 
before he talks about, for example, US, Na US Navy uh, submarine force, which is still a, a, a very advanced submarine force, but what he forgets, of course, that uh, actually you do not count just merely uh, numbers. You, as I already stated, you count of the what is COFM, correlation of forces and means. And while US Navy submarine force is the world class, let me show you something about what he talks about projection, because obviously you have Virginia class, uh, you have the four, which will be very soon uh, um, decommissioned uh, for a high class submarines uh, turned into the uh, Tomahawk platforms pretty much. But uh, still, let's go and take a look about this uh, power. And uh, when you look at this document, as you can see yourself, it is April 2022, a report to Congress on the annual long-range plan for construction of naval vessels for fiscal year 2023. And you can see yourself, it's uh, by Office of the Chief of Naval uh, Operations. And let's see what uh, are the projections. Projections, as you can see yourself, battle force inventory and trade space. So off, let's take a look at the table of the attack submarines. And as you can see yourself, attack submarines constitute, well, the number of attack submarines, as you can see yourself underlined in red, currently stands at about, well, about, because who knows what, but let's say 49, okay, 49 uh, attack submarines. These are the submarines uh, which go into the area and hunt other submarines, while other submarines hunt them, and so we have this whole game of the anti-submarine warfare. And here comes the thing which obviously Alex Little doesn't understand what he's talking about, because, oh my gosh, let Let's go there. And this problem actually hasn't been resolved. This one is from the last year, about half a year, well, more like eight months ago. And as you can see yourself, even CNN reports that nearly 40% of US attack submarines are, are in or awaiting repair as shipyards face worker shortages, supply chain issues. And that means that the number of attack submarines which you uh, have been uh, uh, presented to you, which is 49, uh, for the, you know, let's go uh, for the ease of calculations. Let's go and calculate what is when the 40% of your submarine force is not operational. And this is multiply 50, well, not 49, let's go 50. Uh, <coughs> multiply 50 by, uh, you know, 40%, or take 40%. You immediately minus 20 submarines from this, uh, because uh, four times five, obviously, is 20, you know. So, and... Uh, Guess what? So out of 49 submarines, roughly speaking, you have left operational, which is 29 attack submarines. That's what the uh, uh, inventory of the active submarines uh, which US Navy has right now. And now let us look at the map. I'm not presenting map for you. You should know this from the high school or middle school rather, or maybe even elementary school. Look at the globe. United States has the obviously two oceans on the both sides of it, and as such, it has geographically two fleets. Obviously, it has more fleets as the operational and strategic uh, formations, like seventh fleet, second fleet, and things of this nature. No, no, no. We're talking about the geographical fleets, and they are two, which is of course uh, Pacific and Atlantic. And guess what? So you have 30, about 30 submarines, you have to split between these two theaters. Well, guess what? Even if you go uh, from the like, uh, you know, splitting in, in half, what you have, you have the about 15 attack submarines operating on the theater, well, in Arctic. Of course, you can move forces, uh, you know, between uh, uh, two theaters, you can theoretically move the submarines from Pacific Theater to through Pan Panama Canal, and you can move them uh, up north. But what we have here is probably around 15 subs 
which attacks apps which United States has. Obviously, they can launch their Tomahawk missiles. That's the only thing they carry. But then again, launch at what and from where? That really matters. And when you talk, at the, we're talking about the Russian Northern Fleet, here comes a very interesting statistics. And that tells you that Mr. Little has very little understanding what he's talking about operationally. And let me demonstrate to you uh, some things which, of course, are... If we go into the uh, table of the uh, 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 Northern Fleet, here is the 2024 table for Russian Navy summary. As you can see yourself, if we discard eight, uh, seven of them are brand new strategic missile submarines uh, on, the, uh, on the Northern Fleet, which are eight, what we have there is this. You have atomic cruise missile submarines, which are Severodvinsk primarily class, uh, and uh, the uh, Oscar II class, which are extremely uh, uh, silent. You have five of them. You have multi-purpose submarines. We have tw 12 of them. And then you have also the thing which, for example, U.S. Navy simply doesn't have. You have those really effective diesel submarines, six of them. I'm not talking about special submarines and things of this nature. So, as you can see yourself, 5 plus 12, 17 plus 6, uh, Northern Fleet has 23 operational submarines. So, and this is not where it all ends. Uh, as you can see yourself, we have now this thingy coming. Look at this. The latest one of uh, uh, the Kronstadt submarine is already active, and it's in the Northern Fleet. You have Veliki Luki in sea trials in Northern Fleet, and then you already have there uh, being built another, Volga and Yaroslava. This is Lada class extremely advanced submarines the latest versions of them will be with uh, anaerobic uh, uh, propulsion and here they are and uh, when you begin to add this you suddenly have the situation that well russians probably have a submarine force which it's uh, we're talking about submarines only not just uh, surface ships which of course u.s navy cannot really send surface ships to arctic to fight russia which is ridiculous because they will be all sunk well you know what happens with uh, carriers uh, of uh, tomahawks when they meet carriers of zircon and when you put those numbers together, not only you see yourself the dynamics of uh, uh, Northern Fleet alone having enough wherewithal or enough assets, even if you consider, obviously, as it's always normal, some uh, submarines being in the, uh, you know, how to put it, uh, in repairs, others being in docking, which, you know, normal, you know, routines for submarines. And then suddenly you have the numbers which are really not, already not uh, at least equal, but in uh, w w within the next probably five years, uh, United States Navy and submarine force will have really difficult time dealing with the uh, Russian subs there, which are as quiet, and as advanced as those Virginians or even sea wolves. And when you uh, take a look at this in the picture, and especially when you have the overwhelming dominance of the anti submarine warfare assets there, with Russians flying the whole regiment of the brand new IL 38s with Novella uh, 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 navigational and targeting complex and advanced sonars and things like that. So, yeah, not good chances, you know, to, of survival. Some, of course, can survive, no doubt about it. This always, you know, the warfare is the most democratic affair. Uh, the opponent also has the uh, the word, so to speak, and has the say. Uh, but, you know what, so uh, you can see yourself, the dynamics is not there to support all those, you know, wonderful U.S. submarines and Virginia class are excellent subs. But there is another thing. They do not dive as uh, deep as Russian submarines. Actually, if you take a look at uh, depths which Russian, modern Russian submarines operate, uh, yeah, it's uh, not there for U.S. submarine fleet. And uh, then, of course, uh, Mr. Lidl talks about the situation with uh, that, uh, you know, icebreakers. And he talks about that there are no military icebreakers. Well, he has issues, obviously, because this is a one Papanian, which already has the crew, and it's already going through the state trials right now. Three other of those so-called icebreakers aren't with the artillery, and guess what? Obviously, caliber missile will be uh, installed if need be. So, yeah, Russia has a fleet which 
there in terms of uh, uh, icebreaker fleet are uh, Sweden and Norway and uh, Finland combined are nowhere near those capabilities. So what footprint he is talking about? Uh, United States lost their uh, race, so to speak, for the Arctic, and especially when you look at the Russian bases, which uh, with bunch of the advanced both air defense and strike capabilities, uh, sure, but. You know what? This is uh, basically uh, comes back to uh, this comes back to what uh, I opened this uh, uh, video today with those people, those American scientists, evolutionary biologists, talking f about metaphysical issue that yeah, there is nothing really good which comes out of those old you know specialists you know credential people with all those Harvard and Stanford and what have you degrees. Most of them working in the field of geopolitics are absolute nincompoops. And so as this article, uh, which obviously I used as a vehicle to demonstrate to you how the COFM, correlation of forces and means, changes and what is the dynamics in the Arctic. And it's just really funny, you know, talk about this. And this is what happens when people do not understand the background and the context, especially the context as uh, presented in terms of technology and how military technology actually operates and how it influences including those power projection capabilities. So this is not to say that the US uh, Navy submarine force is bad. No, it's a great submarine force. They have excellent specialists there. They have excellent professionals there. So make no mistake, this is an extraordinarily strong enemy, if, for example, for Russia, let alone China. But, but, I just gave you the numbers. Look at those numbers. And those submarines, look up uh, at some point of time, the U.S. Navy submarine force uh, forbade, for example, Virginia-class submarines to operate near any allied, such as Swedish, Gotland-class, or any other diesel-electric submarines in the shallow waters. Because it will, uh, they would simply see the signature, the, what is called acoustic portrait, really easily. Because they are that good, those diesel subs, they can detect the Virginias b before Virginia can see them. So, there you go. This is just a little bit of the background, and this is all about this credentialism. credentialism pardon me. So, we have now this situation then. Uh, let's go with the fact that uh, now we have the little bit of... Uh, how to put it politely, I, I don't know, that, that's about this credentialism. Here's Mr. Burns, and this is, I believe, from CNN, so it doesn't matter, it's all in the news. So, CIA Director William Burns acknowledged Thursday that without military assistance from the U.S., Ukraine could experience significant setbacks in its war with Russia. Ah, okay, so... You know what? Somebody has to get Mr. Burns and those people from CIA who he works in into the basic uh, strategy program to learn about what is the setback and what is the demolition of the force. But even he, uh, because everything which is done in the political uh, arena in the West today is primarily about the uh, PR uh, and uh, the fear of not to look weak, which is, of course, the rest of the world already laughs at it. But he continues about talk setbacks, while in reality we have the situation of the demolition. And so we have Ukrainians at the tough moment of the battlefield right now, Burns said during Q&A sessions at the Bush Center Forum on Leadership in Dallas. With supplemental assistance from U.S., Burns said Ukrainian force can hold. No, they can't. And yes, this is about the 60 billion. Uh, obviously, they will pass it. Make no mistake. It, it goes without saying that this. I already warned about it for a number of months that it will pass eventually. So the problem is that they will change absolutely nothing. So he continues to talk about they can hold their own on the battlefield in 2023 and continue to do damage with deep strikes in Crimea and against the Black Sea Fleet. Sure, sure, yeah, let them. That's, you know, it's war, sure. But the problem is, of course, it's all the grasping to the last straw and the humiliation of the United States in Ukraine. And it's now need to crawl away from this. In fact, is the war, or rather genocide, which Israel commits in uh, um, Gaza, it's once, in one very bizarre sense, is that 
kind of the off ramp. Byrne said that, that with the boost uh, that would come from the military systems, both well, practically and psychologically. Okay, there you go. That's where you can stop this immediately. The Ukrainians are entirely capable of holding their own through 2024. No, they are not. And he probably knows, but because obviously that but a profession of the former uh, US diplomats today, primarily, not all of them, is lying and given this PR, you know, pep talk. So, but somebody has to tell him and go and study what strategy is military strategy and military grand strategy and so that will explain why he talks about it even even you know what even washington post they couldn't take it anymore and these are all practically zionist media in the united states even they say Palestinian paramedics said Israel gave them safe passage to save a six-year-old girl in gaza they were all killed the, even the Washington Post comes now uh, out with these types of the headlines. It was inconceivable uh, in October and November last year. And even suddenly, even when you have those warmongers in Washington Post recognizing what is happening there, well, what can I say? You know, there's some change there. And just not to be outdone, though, with Mr. Um, Burns, we have now these guys, the Germans. And uh, the Russian embassy in Berlin received a notification about the undesirability of the participation of official relatives, uh, representatives, pardon me, of the Russian Federation in commemorative events on the occasion of the 79th anniversary of liberation of prisoners of concentration camps, said the official representative of the Russian Foreign Ministry, Maria Zakharova. So, yeah, I wrote about this in my blog, and what can I say? Uh, you know what, when you look at especially this behavior of Germany who wants to still to find those patriots for um, Ukraine, uh, the nation will completely berserk and I think so Russians should stop talking to them anyway because yeah, it's, uh, not, even provo it's not even provocation. The fact that uh, Germany tells Russians that they shouldn't be there is rich because if you look attentively at what Red Army did and how many concentration camps, including Auschwitz, uh, it liberated. Sure, Russians do not deserve to be there. And that should wrap it up any sensible relations with Germans because, yeah, this is how they think. They don't like Russians, period. Not all of them, make no mistake. Uh, as I already stated, there are many uh, Germans who are actually migrating now to Russia. But uh, yeah, with present uh, European elites, they have no honor, integrity. They are, they are low lives, say, plain, uh, plain and simple. So, and I'm on record, as I already stated, uh, if it would be up to me, I would repatriate all remains of the Red Army soldiers from every single cemetery in Europe, including removing all monuments from Europe uh, dedicated to Red Army, and I would repatriate them to Russia. Europe doesn't deserve uh, 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 graves of Red Army soldiers. Simply doesn't. There's nothing to talk about in that. And this is pretty much what I wanted to tell you today before you go to the weekend. And uh, you know what? Just guys, have a nice weekend. And uh, as always, I want to thank my wonderful patrons, people who support me, because that allows me to do what I am doing. And uh, as always, guys, those who... Uh, uh, can afford, please support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee and two. And, you know, just su subscribe to my channel. And I'll talk to you later. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.